How do you do? I'm Jane Cleland, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Writer's Room and to introduce you to S.J. Roseanne. Welcome, S.J. S.J. Roseanne is uh, the recipient of numerous awards for her 13 novels. She has won the McCavity, the Seamus, the Edgar, the Nero, and the Anthony, and the Edgar for Best Short Story as well. She's also the recipient of the Japanese Maltese Falcon Award, and in addition, Bronx Noir, a short story anthology that S.J. edited, was chosen by the New Atlantic Independent Booksellers Association as a notable book of the year. S.J. has served on the national boards of the Mystery Writers of America and Sisters in Crime, and she's a former president of the Private Eye Writers of America. She speaks, she lectures, she teaches, and she runs a summer writing workshop in Italy. Among her many honors, uh, here are the ones that really stood out for me. In 2003, S.J. was invited to speak at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. In 2005, uh, Left Coast Crime, that's one of the major mystery conferences that runs each year, uh, S.J. was its guest of honor. And in 2009, Bouchicon, which is the largest mystery conference uh, that runs each year, uh, she was the Toastmaster. All oh, very cool. Today, I have the privilege to chat with SJ about writing and writers and ideas. Thank you, SJ, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. You've written 13 novels. 11 of them are Lydia Chin and Bill Smith in a series, and then there are two standalones. Let's start by my asking you, tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Lydia Bill novels. Bill Smith was my first character. They're private eyes. And Bill Smith is that iconic white guy, voiceover, world-weary private eye. We've known him for uh, over 50 years now. And I wanted to write from that voice because it's a, it's a voice, it's an outsider voice. So it's a voice that can tell stories of power and politics and being at the top from someone who could have been there by birth because he's a straight white male, but decided not to because when, the when price is When you say an outsider, high. what does yeah. that mean, an outsider the, voice? The private eye is always standing There's an out, arm's outside. length distance? Yeah, okay. yeah always from, from yeah. whatever's happening. Yeah. The, the private eye is always, that voiceover is a classic, first person voiceover is a classic private eye film gimmick. Uh, that that the private eye is never part of whatever system it is, okay. and, and can Lydia? see it clearly because of that. Uh, Lydia is also an outsider, being a Chinese American and being a woman and being small. She's always not quite considered part of of things. Oh, interesting. She's always standing with with in, as a Chinese American, one foot in in each world. The Chinese, her Chinese family, doesn't consider her Chinese enough for them, but she's also obviously not white, so she's not a mainstream American. And so they're both outsiders for different reasons. Oh, interesting. Now, of the 11, those are the Lydia Bill books. Right. Were the other two, the plots weren't suitable for the series? Yeah they, were, yeah, they were not Lydia and Bill books at all. They were bigger. One of them is Absent Friends. That was my 9-11 book. And there was no way to write about 9-11 in my mind, within the context of an existing fictional world. It trivialized 9-11. Uh, the other was a book, uh, In This Rain, was a book that, I, a story I'd wanted to tell about the intersection of politics, real estate, and crime in New York. And there was really no place for, for Bill and Lydia. Uh, there, they would have been peripheral mm -hmm, to that mm -hmm, story. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, the new book, Ghost Hero, uh, is a... It's been compared to the Paul Newman, Robert Redford movie, The Sting. I mean, that's from ABC News. Uh, how cool. I mean, oh <laughs> totally my God. Totally cool. I was so excited. <laughs> oh, my God. Is writing humor easier than writing straight narrative? Uh, no, 
because you have to get the balance right. Balance but of what? The balance of, I mean, this, this is about crime, and there are some bad people in it, and, uh, and you have to get the balance of that, of why it's important. Um, the trouble with humor is that it's all funny, and that's all very nice, but why does anybody really care what mm -hmm. happens in this book? Mm -hmm. You know, it's all a big joke. You have to make people care yeah. whether it comes yeah. out, and you have to make the stakes high. What happened, I did not intend for this book to be funny, but what happened was these people just kept carrying on in such a way. And the book is set in the art world, and it's very easy to mock the art world. Yeah. There's so much to mock. <laughs> and I just kept going. Like what? And What's funny? What, what, why is it easy to mock well, the art world? Well, one of the things about the art world is that people spend enormous amounts of money on things that it's very hard to justify. They are not beautiful, they're not well crafted, they don't have much to say, they happen to be the thing of the moment. I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, it's a very easy... Now, in Ghost Hero, uh, you mentioned art, it's specifically Chinese art, and yeah. I've noticed over the years, you focus a lot on China. Yeah, yeah, T yeah. Talk about that, why? Well, Lydia Chin is Chinese-American, and, and, and that was to give her an outsider position. Race in America is, is the most obvious outsider position to take, and I, the Chinese culture has always interested me. It's always been something that I've studied in, in college, and in, in, even in high school, I was, I was reading uh, Chinese-American writers, and Chinese poetry, Chinese architecture, yeah, Chinese yeah, so art. Yeah, it's just been an interest. So that when I came to create the character, I wanted an outsider character by race, she seemed like the obvious a, a, yeah. a, a, uh, a Chinese American seemed like something I might be able to handle. You've mentioned that you uh, created her and and Bill as outsiders. From a writer's point of view, why is that useful? Why did you want outsiders? Because you can comment on what's going on. Someone in the middle of something can't necessarily see it, and and can tell a different story which is what I was doing in, in Absent Friends. You know, it's so interesting that you're saying that. I, I think that choosing the voice, choosing the perspective, whose story is it, yeah. are among the most important and complex of questions. You're known from shifting perspectives. Some of it's Lydia, some of it's Bill. You're noted for uh, sometimes even an omnipotent narrator. How do you make those decisions? I, I can't really say their decisions Although once or twice I found myself being wrong in a short story uh, or two, I twice, and this was both Lydia, I started short stories for Lydia and realized that she was the extraneous character, that she really had no part in the unfolding of events. They could unfold very well without her, thank you very much. Usually, though, the story and the character to whom it's happening occur at the same time. It, it's not just a story, it's the story of this person who the, is, a, is a thrill junkie. Ah, That's in, yeah, yeah. Uh, in this rain, I had four simultaneous stories going on, and one of them was the story of, of this woman who was a thrill junkie. Interesting. N nobody else could have told that story. I want to read the first sentence uh, from your newest novel, Ghost Hero, Be my guess. then ask a couple of questions about your use of language. In a relentlessly chic and tranquil tea shop on the Lower East Side, I sat sipping gunpowder green and trying to figure out what my new client was up to. Now, you're a wonderful writer. Thank you. <laughs> that sentence is 30 words long. I, I find it astonishing how much information you packed into those 30 words. We know where the book is set, not just the city, but the neighborhood. Uh, we know that the narrator is someone who likes tea, and this one really struck me. We know that the narrator is someone who knows the color of gunpowder. And then, of course, we know that she's also someone, or he, that has clients. Do you always try, is that a conscious decision to try to pack that much information into a first sentence? Into every sentence. The more work you can get one item to do, and this comes, I was trained as an architect, and this was something we always had beaten into us, that everything should solve more than one problem. The more problems it solves, the more elegant it is. So each sentence... That's so interesting. Yeah, it, and it's, it's really, it, it's, uh, it's, it's 
It's a great approach. So each sentence has to do as many things as you can make it do. The other thing that happens in that sentence is that you find out that right away, whoever this is, doesn't trust the client. Yeah, yeah. So not only has one, Figure but, what he's up to. Right, right, right. But took the client on. Right. Even though she doesn't trust him. So how do you avoid duplicating uh, such distinctive descriptions, relentlessly chic or gunpowder green? Well, gunpowder green, I cannot take um, credit for, really. It's, it's, it's a commonly used uh, expression to describe a particular green tea. Everybody calls it gunpowder green because I guess it's what the I guess I don't drink that kind of like. tea. Um, well, I actually, yeah. when I read it, I looked up gunpowder. I did an yeah. image search, and it's yeah. a particular shade of green, yeah, and that I, camouflage I think, green. I think that's why they call yeah. this gunpowder green. Interesting, interesting. You teach writing, too, isn't yeah. that right? Yeah. Um, uh, that's something that we share. When I teach, I tend to be very directive. I, uh, I inform students about a specific tip of craft technique, and then I challenge them to apply it. How do you approach teaching? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't do that because I run out of tips really fast. I, I focus on specificity. If there's one thing I want people to learn over a two-week workshop, or I'll be teaching at Crime Fiction Academy this spring, so that's 14 weeks. Um, I want them to learn to be specific. I don't want to hear. I was frightened. I want to hear my heart was racing. And if you can give me a metaphor for your heart racing, you know, my, racing my, my heart was racing like a Ferrari, and, you know, mm -hmm. that's even better. Um, I, I, it's all in, in specificity. I also lean a little on the sound of the language. I stopped a guy in my last class who had written about um, a bright white light, and I said, and I forget, there were a couple of other words in there. And I said, you've used five adjectives. Every one of them is one syllable, and every one of them has a long I sound. You can't do that, um, or you can't do that without it being noticed. So if you do that, you must mean it. And it's, he looked at me like he had never heard this kind yeah, of thing Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? The words matter. The, the words, sound the of the, sound words, of the matter. words really matters. And you know, there's one thing in coming up with ideas. There's another in being able to execute to them, embody them elegantly. Yeah. yeah, and that, to me, I, a lot of writers want to be able to tell their story, and the telling is really important, so the, interesting. as important as the yes, story. Yeah. Uh, we'll be right back with SJ's thoughts on an issue that eludes many writers, uh, new and experienced, and that is, where do you get ideas? And how do you decide if those ideas have any value?